Hi everyone, today I'm going to uh, uh, return to some recent uh, February 2023 Blu-ray releases um, uh, and I'm going to start off with a film that I probably anticipated more eagerly than any other film uh, released in the first quarter of 2023 and that is the Kino release of The Lady from Shanghai starring Rita Hayworth, Orson Welles Directed by Orson Welles, but he does not take a directing credit. <laughs> it just says written and produced by Orson Welles in the credits. Uh, and it is a film that is a bit, that could reasonably be called a visually sumptuous film. It uh, was released in 1948. Uh, Welles was working within the studio system made for Columbia Pictures. Uh, this is a story uh, where Wells plays a kind of ordinary man, very much different than what he or, that he would usually play the larger-than-life character. He is, here he is somewhat ordinary, so somewhat against type. His nickname is Black Iris. He's a sailor. Uh, he has a big temper. He can really fight when, uh, uh, when he gets angry. Uh, and th that comes in handy because he's wandering through Central Park and a woman is, is, uh, is being mugged by three, uh, three uh, uh, criminals and he uses his temper and his pugilistic skills to save her. <clears throat> uh, they strike up a friendship. Uh, she <clears throat> learns that he is a sailor and she, her husband is a very rich lawyer. They're about to leave New York uh, and sail through the Panama Canal and up to San Francisco. They need another crew member. She invites, he's, he's sort of hesitant because he's attracted to her, but he knows she's married. Uh, but eventually he does agree to join the crew. And then along the way, he gets involved in a very convoluted murder plot. So the film greens from location to location, New York City, uh, Mexico, Acapulco, uh, and eventually San Francisco. And it's a visually amazing film, as they say, and you know, it ends with uh, very, uh, two very famous uh, passages, one in a, at, both at an amusement park, one in the fun house, and then in the Hall of Mirrors. Uh, that, a, a, a sequence that will stay in your, your memory forever, I can guarantee it. <clears throat> and, but the plot, of the story is the murder plot is like I say it's incomprehensible and uh, when when Harry Cohn the head of Columbia Studios saw the film uh, with fellow executives he offered a thousand dollars to anybody who could explain the plot to him and there's three commentaries on this uh, Kino release one's by Imogen Sarah Smith a uh, great commentary and Towards the end of it, she takes up Harry Cohn's challenge. I'm going to take a stab at, at, at explaining the plot, but even she couldn't explain it. There's two plot holes that just don't make any sense. So this is Wells' attempt. Uh, this is one of his, uh, really one of his last times where he tried to make a film for a studio, a Hollywood studio. He, he did want to find his place it, it, to see if he had a place within the studio system. His previous film was The Stranger, and it starred him, he dire directed it, starred in it with Loretta Young, Edward G. Robinson. It was an ordinary kind of film, <laughs> especially in comparison to a nor uh, usual Orson Welles movie, but it made money, audiences liked it. It's the only film Orson Welles ever made that made money. Um, but with this film, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the genesis of this film is that he um, was, Orson Welles was in New York City. He was mounting a very expensive Broadway production. He needed $50,000 uh, to, to pay for the costumes where, where the, the, uh, the Broadway production was uh, defunct. So he, he said to Harry Cohn, Pay me fifty thousand. I'll make a film where I'm an actor. And Orson Welles was always employable as an actor. I'll direct it. I'll act it, and I'll get Rita Hayworth to star in it with me. Orson Welles and Rita Hayworth were married at the time, even though they were going through a very tumultuous uh, stretch. She had always wanted to make a film with Orson Welles, with her husband. 
Harry Cohn said, yeah, sure, $50,000 for all that, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, so, uh, but when he, he, when he pitched the idea, he hadn't actually, he, he tells Harry Cohn, I've got this book, and, 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 and Orson Welles loved Pulp Fiction. And he saw a cover, he, he, he said, oh, the book's great, even though he had never read it, and uh, it'll make a terrific film. So, the, and, and because he didn't want to continue to making ordinary films, this is, uh, Lady from Shanghai is made in the Wells style, visual style, so every shot is special. Uh, there was not enough attention for sure to the screenplay here. Supposedly some other people also worked on the screenplay, but much of it reportedly was written on the fly. You would keep writing scenes for the next day, the previous night. Uh, and when you when you see an Orson Welles film that is is typical visually the visual style is typical of what he did every shot is special, uh, and so you, you, he couldn't he couldn't shoot an ordinary shot he didn't want to do it and and so he he continues on through making this film, uh, and, and you could say. From a commercial point of view, it's it, it's probably too much. Audiences can't. He was it, Wells was making sort of experimental films. Even Citizen Kane is very much an experimental film. It has a very strange vibe to it. All his films have very strange vibes to it. And you are they overdone? Is it too much for for a mainstream audience for a commercial success for Orson Welles to continue making films in this style? Uh, and in Lady from Shanghai. You not only have this this intense visual style, uh, you 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 also don't have likable characters. Everybody is in 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 uh, Orson Welles's character, Black Irish, in this in the film. He he mentions uh, he tells a story about sharks, and really that and that's who these characters are. They're all sharks, and he tells a story about how. And it's supposedly a true story. He saw a shark, a wounded shark, and the blood lust brought other sharks, and they started feeding on that shark, feeding on themselves, sharks eating themselves up. Well, it's an interesting idea, but a mainstream audience usually wants to have some character in the film that they can identify with. Uh, I, I saw, I once saw um, Touch of Evil with my father. It was I was a teenager. My father was kind of a crotchety old old man. At least that's what he seemed like to me when I was a teenager. And we watched the film together. And surprisingly enough, he actually stayed awake. And when the film was over, and I was, you know, I thought it was one of the greatest films I ever seen. It's all, it's certainly it's still one of my favorite all time films. But I asked my father, "What'd you think?" And he, you know, looked all grumpy. And he said, uh, oh, "It was overdone. Way too overdone." And I, I think that's that is a valid criticism. My <laughs> father was, you know, that for him and for a mass audience, this, the commercial value of this film uh, was, was simply wasn't there. Now, also, he before the film started, he had Rita Hayworth's long flowing hair cut, and he had it dyed blonde with her approval. Harry Cohen wasn't too crazy about the idea because. Rita Hayworth was their biggest star. She had um, she had been uh, uh, she had she had long dark hair, but they they dyed it red for her Technicolor movies, and so I thought she looked great. This is kind of the Lana Turner kind of uh, blonde. Of course, Rita Hayworth was one of the most beautiful movie stars of all time, and especially in the 1940s. So I thought she looked great, but Harry Cohen. Big objection was that when he saw the dailies, where are the close-ups of Rita Hayworth? <laughs> There's no close-ups of her. She's our biggest star. People are going to want to see close-ups. So when they finally did get back to, to the studio in Hollywood, Wells had to shoot some scenes in which he could show, uh, which he could insert um, uh, close-ups of Rita Hayworth, and. And in, in, uh, in, uh, further emphasizing Wells's perversity towards making studio films, he he uh, he shot many close-ups of a very odd-looking character actor by the name of Glenn Anders, who plays Grisby in this film, and he is one of the creepiest characters. He almost jumps off the screen at you with his creepiness. Um, so, the movie had a very very much of a troubled post-production. Uh, the 
it was 155 minutes, the original cut. Uh, it did not preview well. Of course, it was never going to be 155 minutes, but evidently it was incomprehensible at 155 minutes as well as 90 minutes, and which was its final running time. So uh, I don't know. I think Wells was off making another movie uh, when the editing, final editing process, uh, I don't know, was was uh, was done. I don't know that he would he, he was even invited to participate in that. But he did send a memo with instructions of what he thought should be cut. Uh, but uh, more than likely, the studio didn't pay any attention to that memo. Um, so he wasn't involved in it, uh, he, and probably that's why he didn't want to take a directing credit on the film. Uh, but again, there's three commentaries, uh, and there's, there's two more cover art uh, designs. This is the actual uh, uh, physical case. I can't get the glare, it's a very sunny day. The sunlight, the daylight is my, <laughs> is my lighting system, and here's, here's the other. Uh, cover art, but they, they, the Kino supplies just great supplements here. I mentioned a commentary by uh, Imogen Sarah Smith, uh, and she always gives a great commentary, and this is, this is one of her best. Another commentary, these are new commentaries, another one from Tim Lucas. Uh, again, he, 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 there's some overlap in their information, which was understandable, but they're, both of them are well worth listening to. No challenge for me, I love commentaries. I love to hear people talk about films, even if I don't care that much for the commentaries. Uh, but it also gives me an excuse to watch the film again. And I find myself appreciating a film uh, uh, a lot more when I watch it without the dialogue and the, and the music and just look at the way the film was shot. And so I could watch Lady from Shanghai over and over again. It's just so visually sumptuous. Then there is, there's a third um, archival commentary with Peter Bogdanovich in which he, uh, which I didn't listen to, but there's also about a 20, 30 minute interview with Bogdanovich, which he talks all about the film. And I, I would assume that the, that the commentary or this interview contains pretty much the highlights of what his commentary would have, uh, uh, would have provided for you. Um, and then I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about a book that I recently finished, and this is Orson Welles, Whatever Happened to Orson Welles, A Portrait of an Independent Career, and this is by Joseph McBride. Now McBride wrote, wrote two other uh, books on Orson Welles, uh, sorry for the shaking, um, one was a straight biography, which I have read many years ago, and also one that compared Orson Welles, the director, with Orson Welles, the actor. Like I say, he was always employable as an actor, and he always took his roles very seriously. Um, uh, although in his later life, he was very much employable as a commercial in, in making, in narrating, and acting in, in commercials. In fact, that's how he made his living for about the last uh, 20 years of his life. Um, and in this book by Joseph McBride, uh, he covers uh, several films, the, uh, the ind independent uh, productions and how they got made, but most of it is on the other, it concerns the other side of the wind, which was a very, again, a very troubled production. It took years to make. It never, it never was edited. He, uh, Orson Welles never uh, had enough money to edit it, and then I guess the original owner got um, uh, got control of the movie, he couldn't get it back to, to edit it. And then it was controlled by Orson Welles' daughter after Orson Welles died, and she didn't want that film, the, the, uh, the, the many, many reels of film that were shot uh, for the other side of the wind to be reconstructed into a viable film to be released. But finally she relented, and Netflix uh, financed it. I think The Other Side of the Wind is still playing on Netflix. And it was, uh, um, uh, it was a film, so Joseph McBride in 1970 is in the film. He befriended Orson Welles uh, just by chance. He called him up and they, they, he, Orson Welles finally relented. So I'll come over and just talk. They got along famously. So well, The Other Side of the Wind took many years of filming and, and he, the, some of the, the actors and the crew would have to be sort of on call for these years. So whenever, whenever 
Wells said, I got enough money, we can shoot. Uh, um, Joseph McBride had to go. Uh, Orson Welles had this cameraman who, who uh, shot por pornographic movies, but he was an excellent uh, uh, cinematographer. And uh, he, he was totally loyal to, to Wells. So no matter what he was doing, he would drop what he was doing and go and shoot some more of the other side of the wind. Wells was the kind of person who did in fact inspire loyalty in people, especially amongst actors as well. Um, but he expected that kind of loyalty. And uh, Wells had come back to Hollywood in the 70s. It was a new Hollywood. He thought maybe there would be a place here that studios would finance his films and uh, because they were doing that with young directors. And, but it was too late. Uh, Orson Welles simply had burned a whole lot of bridges. He was somebody who amongst Hollywood uh, financiers was thought to be a little bit of a lunatic. What this book points out is that Orson Welles continued to shoot film. He was constantly shooting film, whether, and none of them were completed. Up until the day he died, he had a set out in his backyard. He and his companion were, were preparing another scene to be shot the following day. Uh, and, and supposedly there's reels and reels of all this unfinished filming. Uh, that exists somewhere in the warehouse, and um, so he had. He was addicted to making films. Every whether they were completed or not, he had to be constantly working on a project, and it's kind of a sad story. But I think even he himself thought, "This is my character. This is who. This is my destiny. I, I couldn't. I couldn't do ordinary stuff." He and, and this this kind of character is your destiny. Uh, appears very often in, in Wells's films as a theme. There's a, I think it's in The Trial or one of, one of Orson Wells's films where he tells the story about the scorpion and, and uh, the, um, even if, if it's self-destructive, you have to follow what your character is. <laughs> it is your fate. Um, so uh, <clears throat> the next up, I'm going, the next two films are going to be very obscure films. I've been talking recently about very uh, very uh, well-known films. Uh, now I'm going to talk about two very, next up will be uh, two videos on very obscure films. This is Let's Hope It's a Girl, directed by Mario Monticelli, famous uh, for making a big deal on Madonna Street in the 50s. This is a film from the 1980s with an all-star international cast, including Catherine New, I believe, Ullman. I don't think I, well, I know I've never seen it. I don't think I've ever had an opportunity to see it. It probably was released in New York, Chicago. Valley, or, uh, L.A. Uh, and the other, the other film, too, is one I've never seen, and this is by Jacques Rivette, Love on the Ground, with Geraldine Chaplin and Jane Birkin. This is also from the 80s, and the late 80s, and uh, released through Kena Lorber, but it's a um, Cohen Media uh, collection. And they've, this is the second one, the second Rivette film that they've released, and I think they have two or three more coming. They're releasing uh, one a month. So that's what's up next. Um, I went on a little bit too long in this video. I apologize for that. I do appreciate everybody who listened. Comments are welcome. Take care.